Bits, good morning everybody, back again for another day of the Itsy Bitsy Spider Show. We're promoting the Itsy Bitsy Spider Kickstarter, it has one more day to go, so we'll be doing shows today and tomorrow, and then that'll be it at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, the show will be over. There's Itsy Bitsy Spider himself, my co-host Chris Porro, uh, and our special guest Dr. Tim Duran. Uh, he joined us right at the very start of this series uh, to kick us off. Uh, so I guess he's back today to grade our project and uh, talk a little bit more about history and Paleolithic ancestors and all sorts of things like that. So uh, we'll be back right after this music. Now I'm just going up this water spout, y'all. Y'all, y'all. Hope it don't rain. The itsy bitsy spider climbed up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out Out came the sun and dried up all the rain So the itsy bitsy spider climbed up the spout again All right. Good morning, Tim. Hello. Thank you for rejoining us here for uh, another conversation. Yeah, we've had quite a month, haven't we, Chris? Yeah, we have. Um, now we're doing backlight theater. Backlit theater. I like it. We're all yes. backlit. <laughs> uh, I've got a front light here. Yeah. Yeah. We had a we'll crazy down. amount of good guests. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, Tim, you set a very high standard for guests on your last appearance oh, uh, and uh, the guests we've had since have, I have lived up to it. You know, we've had some very interesting conversations about this, that art and creativity. And uh, we had Andrew Scott on who talked to, uh, he wrote a book, Fake History. So we learned a little bit about modern history. But uh, yeah, I'm still sort of interested in delving more into ancient history. You know, I, I had an idea. Okay, we had also had my friend Jonathan Lemon, who does, um, you know, a daily comic strip. Uh, uh, he does well, his own one called Rabbits Against Magic, and then he does one called Ali Oop, which is a famous strip. You might know Ali Oop because I think it goes back to like the 20s and 30s or something. It's one of the early comic strips and it's been around. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he's the artist on that now. So a time traveling caveman. I, I had a sort of similar sort of idea set amongst like uh, early early sort of humans i got this idea about paradise i drew this illustration i don't know if you can see it on my wall it's not very clear i'll try and find a better image of it but uh no, you can't really see that but up on my wall there i have uh what they call paradise island and if i can make that bigger oh wait right, okay, let me put myself up there. there we go okay well you can't quite see it but it's from my book where's the mermaid uh you know it's a sort of peaceable kingdom scene the mermaid's on a beautiful beach um, you know, on a deserted island, all the animals are sort of living together. And there's a group of monkeys sort of on the tree. And I don't know, I sort of got this idea about why do we think that paradise is paradise? Um, and I thought, well, maybe that's because we spent a very long time as uh, wading apes. David Attenborough had a theory about wading apes uh, that, you know, we waded. And that makes sense to me because we look a bit like dolphins. You know, dolphins were mammals that went back in the sea. And, you know, they... <laughs> you know, so I think we spend a lot of time on the beaches, you know, fishing and eating fruit off the trees. And then there were, I saw some study about, ge um, you know, the genetics. And it said that we come, you know, studying DNA and mutations. They said that we came out of sort of northern Africa and sort of moved across and down and went through southern India and then into um, into Australia. Then, you know, the, so the genome sort of shows up again amongst the Aboriginal people. So, you know, it seems like we spent a lot of time on very beautiful beaches, you know, on palm trees. So is that why when we go to a beach, we think that's paradise? So I, I sort of had an idea maybe for a comic strip about sort of hominids on the beach. They're living in paradise. But, you know, they're thinking of all these things that could make life better. And maybe there's some time traveling aliens back there who are meddling with their DNA as well. You know, so then they could, then they would also have the power to go back and forth through time. So I don't know if that, so yes, that, that's sort of something I'm talking about. That's a good basis for a comic strip. 
<laughs> that sounds like a great basis for a comic strip. I love it very much. And I, I like the time traveling aliens. That's that's fun too. Yes, yes, they're, they're sort of experimenting with the idea. Maybe, maybe they've done it several times. You know, maybe like humans have sort of got intelligent and blown each other, blown themselves up, and you know. So, but now, that, but now because the aliens started messing with time, they can't get it back right again. So the aliens themselves have sort of messed up a little bit. They don't exactly know what they're doing either. Okay. So you know, <laughs> me likey. <laughs> yeah, I think I like that one. It might be you know that's my idea. If I do a day, ever go back to a daily strip, I think that's what I will do. <laughs> So yeah, out out on the beach. Is everything set on a beach? Yes, yeah, so it would basically be set on the beach. So it'd be fun to draw as well. And I because really, I really like drawing that scene of them. Let me let me see if I can pull up a higher quality image. That particular scene. Um, all right. Uh, so, but yeah, would that have any basis in actual fact? Is what I'm. <laughs> I, we have no evidence for alien time travelers, um, but and as far as people wanting to be near uh, rivers and beaches to, because those are food sources, that's that's extremely clear. Um, so that that part I like. Uh, that part makes perfect sense. Yes. Um, yeah. The, the, when I when I do so, I teach a class. I, I don't know if I mentioned this last time. I teach a class called Big History. Um, and did I mention this last time I was on your show? Uh, no, I don't remember. No, I don't think so. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so yes, just, I like it. I like Big History. My idea of Big History came from H.G. Uh, Wells's book. Right. Like the Outline of history, history, 1920. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so, I thought that that put all history into place for me. I sort of I learned history in bits in school. I read that, and he sort of said, "Here's a big picture of the whole thing." You know. Mm -hmm. And he sort of ends up talking about like we need something like the United Nations or something. Right. That 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 was mm -hmm. that was a really good early big history because if you'll recall, he starts way before human beings, and I love that. So he starts. Yes. He he has a chapter in that. But I have two copies of that. I don't have a 1920 uh, edition, but I think I have a 1923 edition. So I have a very very early edition of that. I remember one chapter is called Life Invades Land. And so that that shows the bigness of the history. So he he and he was very well educated on scientific matters because um, he, he did like popular science and that sort of thing. And then, of course, he made it big with uh, The Time Machine, which was serialized in 1893 and then published as a book in 1895. And that at that point, he didn't have to do a lot of work anymore. He could just write. But in 1920, um, so this was right after the, the Great War, he he put together um, an outline of history. And, uh, you know, he, he used the best scientific knowledge at that time to talk about things like evolution in general, which people knew a fair amount about since the origin of species by Darwin had come out in 1859. So there was a lot of information available and Wells was at the top of it. He had come from a pretty... Um, a pretty undistinguished background. His father was a part-time soccer player and gardener. His mother was a housekeeper, but he had been a kind of child prodigy. Um, he had spent, I think, a year in bed because of a broken bone or something like that. And so he had just read and read and read. So really interesting guy. And that, yes, that love it. they had a recording of him, I heard recently, um, where he was speaking. He, he, he sort of talked like this. He was a very sort of nerdy, like English guy. And there are lots of guys that talk like that, you know. <laughs> it's kind of quite interesting, yeah. <laughs> I think the equivalent now is the UC Santa Cruz accent. Have you have either of you ever heard the UC Santa Cruz accent? Uh, well, uh, no, I, I didn't know that. Uh, there I'm was a thing. There is a specific UC Santa Cruz accent. I started to hear it in the 90s. And uh, people that went to UC... <laughs> I, so I was working in San Francisco at that time, and I was working in a in a in a natural food store on Polk Street called Real Foods. And the, I would occasionally meet people who had gone to UC Santa Cruz, and they had a certain kind of voice, and it was a kind of voice like this. And I couldn't imagine that they all naturally spoke that way. I slowly realized that the, it was like a meme. The professors, some of the professors, professors must have been talking like that. And so it became like a, some sort of sign of, I don't know, sincerity or authenticity amongst the students at UC Santa Cruz. And this continued. And people would actually talk like this if they'd gone to UC Santa Cruz. It was very, very interesting. So I wonder if Wells' voice was kind of an unconscious uh, affectation like that. <laughs> It's almost no, like it's an Ed Cullen. It's very funny you should say that. There was a there was a British sketch show called The Far Show, and they would have like a beardy professor who would come from the University of Southern California, which is actually really more your territory there. Yes. But he spoke with exactly that accent. 
<laughs> come on and do some little crazy experiment or something. I, I, I remember know. the fashion show. show. Yeah, you should. You, I thought that that was more of a Southern California rather than Santa Cruz. Yes, I, I remember the fast show very well. I remember the old guy in front of his fireplace and would say he would say some story that was completely incomprehensible <laughs> and then he would end with and i was very drunk i remember yeah, that very, very drunk. that was a that was a wonderful show oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> up there with league of gentlemen and inside number nine on my oh yes you, oh yes you were posting league of gentlemen yes. the other day i was like wow yes. I, I, know, I saw it here they showed it here on bbc america but i didn't realize that anybody else here was familiar oh with yeah that. it's yeah there's a sort of there's a sort of fan club inside number nine is the other one to see that's that's two of the three guys from league of gentlemen Reese, yes uh, i've seen some of those yes i haven't seen a lot yeah yes, but, those yeah. are absolute classics <laughs> yeah i'm i'm of the generation that hates monty python and it's not because monty oh. python's bad it's not because <laughs> anything bad about monty python it's just but there's a generation <laughs> yes people, i'm of the generation of, of where people in high school would come up and start imitating monty python really loudly with those stupid male tries to do a female voices Oh, well, oh, yeah. oh my God! It, it, it was so much of that just breaks on my nerves. I can't hear it, all. and I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm not saying they're stupid. They're obviously brilliant, but I can't hear it at all. I, I can't be around Monty Python. If I'm at a party and someone starts imitating Monty Python, I just leave. Um, but League of Gentlemen was yeah. my sort of Monty Python. That that was that comes around, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, I guess. And I was listening. Yes, I yes, was, I think yes, yes, late nineties. Well, I couldn't. Stop. I remember some this British guy at my work. He's like. Hey mate, you gotta hear this. You gotta see this. And he lends me this. He lends me the DVD pack of the first season. Every and I couldn't quite get to it right away. And every single day he would come to work. Did you watch it yet? Did you watch it yet? And finally I saw it, and I was I was like, this is literally the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, ever in my entire life. Um, the opera, so have you seen the whole thing? Yes, I've seen every single episode of the three seasons. All three yes. seasons. And, but the third season goes absolutely insane. Yeah, I liked the first one the best, actually. Yes. Um, the, 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 yes, last the third one, one is like they get more and more experimental and weird. And like the third one is sort of distinctly sort of like, oh, my God, it's just very creepy and weird. It also got kind of dirtier and grosser because when you see Benjamin yes. with the jobs, the job restart woman, Pauline, and they're doing romantic stuff together that's kind of <laughs> not nice. And I, I didn't I thought that was going too far for me. But um, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I like the first season. Uh, the the whole thing about Benjamin. Uh, sorry, not Benjamin. Yeah, Benjamin and and the, and his aunt and uncle who are yes, yes. frog. Uh, they're they're toad. Uh, toad Yes, a frog is not a toad. Aqua Vita. That, that's probably the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. So um, Aqua Vita. Yes. Well, my my favorite expression for that one is it's fine. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's when that's when what the, the right that's when Benjamin has to fine. sleep in that room. This room also serves as my study. Well, if it's any inconvenience, I can no Benjamin. It's fine. The sort of a uh, heavy weight of uh, of of um passive aggressive voices. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I just us. I just wiki wiki it. <laughs> you get me. I, I, might check I, have it out. A, I have some of them on DVD. I don't think I don't think I have the third season. <laughs> I couldn't watch I, the third season. I think season. it's all in Britbox. Yeah, or oh, so, Britbox. Yes, that's good. Yeah, yeah. you can come around Brit and watch it sometime, Chris. Yeah. Is that a streaming service? It is. It's like Netflix, but just Brit, for British stuff. All right, but we have a, we have a few nerds watching this show, uh, and uh, chief among them is Dale. He's here. Hi, Dale. Thank you. Uh, he's our resident expert on pop culture. Uh, when I say nerds, I'm, of course, I'm referring to myself as well. But uh, yes, so nerds will be happy to know that League of Gentlemen, um, now some of those actors, uh, oh, who is, uh, um, one of them went on to be very prominent in writing Doctor Who. Mark uh, Yattis. Mark um, Yattis. Yeah. Uh, Steve. Mark Gattis. Oh, Steve. Uh, okay. I, I thought it was oh, yeah, Mark, Mark Gattis. Gattis. Yeah, and Mark Steve, Gattis. Yes. Uh, Yes, and he really played are. he played um, he played Mycroft in the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock. Also, yes, yes, Mycroft, yes, Mycroft, yes, yes, and he wrote that too. He he was involved in writing that him uh, and uh, yes, and then Steve Pemberton's done a lot of things as well. Although he's more popular on British TV, I think. But yes, uh, right. definitely Mark Gassis is you know he he was responsible a lot for a lot of Doctor Who episodes and writing a lot of these sort of. Uh, British shows that have done quite well. I think, yeah, that really, yeah, he's, uh, he's he's gone very big. Yeah, yes. So that's all it, very exciting. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so Chris Chris looks totally bemused. <laughs> we no, have to I, I'm, I'm reading the, the wiki, wiki page because I've 
I've never heard of this, and I'm I'm reading the wiki page and trying to figure out where I can see it. Um, it it's yeah, you can see you Brit, can see Britbox. You say sections on there are some, there are some sections on YouTube, but you're not going to get the full glory if you just watch a few minutes. So I would I would just I'm get, like, I why isn't there? Why isn't there like an American uh, ripoff of it that's not quite as good? Is that in the works? It's like yeah, twenty years it's, old now. It's too weird and <laughs> too weird, but you never you never know. I, I, the problem is that okay, not not to sound racist, but I know everyone loves it, <laughs> but British TV is generally smarter, or at least the stuff that ends up over here, because there's a sort of assumption that British people actually enjoy Shakespeare and you know have a certain level of literacy, whereas unfortunately that assumption cannot be sustained when it comes to American TV because. A lot of Americans have never cracked a book before and certainly can't read. <laughs> so, so there's going to be stuff that works for a British audience that you'd have to change so much as to destroy it if you were to adapt it for an American audience. Having said that, I still think that the American office is excellent. And I, I started with the British The Office. I'm the only person who can claim mm. that he watched the entirety of the British office while on honeymoon in Riga, Latvia. <laughs> Um, and so, and, and I was very wow. resistant to watching the American <laughs> office. I was very resistant for years, and then I finally did, and I didn't like it at first. And then after a while, I kept watching it, and after a while, I said, "No, this actually does work. This the American The Office is actually very good." So, my favorite thing for a long time was whenever I would say to anyone, "Hey, do you watch The Office?" And they would go, "American or British?" And I would say, <laughs> "I've seen them both, and I like them both." Because yes. for a while, that. people would try to like get in these digs. Like, oh, I only do the British one. And I would say, I love the British one, but I also love the American one. And, yeah. and the British one, you run, there's only so much of it as well. You know, it's more of a limited thing. It's two short right. British you know, six episode seasons and a right. finale. Right. And then, well, he's done a few other things now. But then, but then he had that character. He had his character come in and he was involved in the American office as well. So, yes. you know, they know. Well, who? You know, Ricky that, that Gervais? Was a Ricky Gervais, yeah. Ricky Gervais, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, he put it in, yeah. you know, he had it in Slough, which I know Slough quite well. That's not far from Basingstoke. Basingstoke and Slough are quite similar. Okay. Slough's a bit more depressing even than Basingstoke. <laughs> and, um, you know, but I think Ricky Gervais himself, I think, came from Reading, I was told. Well, this is probably an urban rumor that a lot of people say, but I know somebody who said he had worked in an office with the guy that Ricky Gervais apparently based his character off of. I, d I don't know if that's true. I'm sure there's a lot of people like that in Reading. <laughs> That was one of the best characters. Was was the, the, the that that boss that he that Ricky plays in in the show? It was completely deluded, self deluded sort of person thinking that he's cooler. I, I absolutely love that character. Very yes, very yes. cringy, like yes. extra. It's like the American version with extra cringe. Yep, 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 yep. yep. So did you it's all just want the sort of humdrumness of everyday life and what's life? And, you know, my son really likes it. It was very interesting. You know, they, those oh, sort of kids like that, another generation of like the American one. But I can't get him to watch the British one yet. It's still like, I haven't done very good at converting him to any of the, <laughs> anything really. He's, you know, he's not very interested in the old world culture. A little bit. Have you brought cool. him back there? What? Hmm? Have you brought yeah. Sam over to Europe or England or anything? Uh, yes, I've taken him over there. Yeah, but uh, you know, he goes over. If he meets kids his age, they all talk about um, video games that they played. You know, they all play Minecraft or whatever. So they have their own sort of shared generation. Like our generation, we talk about uh, <laughs> Hong Kong Fui, the the banana splits, yes, Scooby Doo, some of those things are universal. <laughs> yes, Hong Kong Fui. I haven't thought about that for a while. Though. Yes. Neither have right. I. Okay, now Tina's asking about Little Britain here. Oh, I've seen a little bit of that. Uh, and, and I thought that some of the people on League of Gentlemen actually worked a little bit on that. I, I've seen a little bit. I should see more. Shut the door. The barking of dogs. Um, yes, uh, I do, they're different. They're different. I mean, I guess the different... Okay, the thing about these shows, Chris, is that they're done by like groups of comedians like the little uh britain i don't know how where they got together but i know that legal gentlemen they got together like at university you know they're like a group they would do edinburgh fringe you know they would do a little stage show with the three of them so you sort of build it up like that and again little britain he was around that the guy the only game the british guy uh i'm not I'm terrible at names but uh <laughs> uh yes yeah, so like a comedy was, troupe um, yeah, so they, they, he was kind of on things being a bit weird. There was a show called uh, with Vic, these two guys, Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer, 
who did this totally surreal show that was going on in the early 90s. And at first, it took me a long time. I didn't really get it at first. Other people watched it laughing. But, you know, after I watched it a little bit, you, it, it, was, it was very, very funny, but it was completely surreal. And I don't think you could get it on here at all. Uh, but he would sort of appear on that a little bit, uh, you know, and then, you know, his co-writers there, David Williams, he's now very successful as a children's book writer. You know, my, yeah. my Where's the Bunny got up quite high in the charts at one point last Easter. But yeah, he, he already had three books up there. You know, <laughs> he's doing very well. <laughs> All right. We've got some questions like John Lowry here. So John Lowry's from Florida. Thanks, John, for tuning in. Uh, OK, he likes Top Gear. Yes, yes. All right, Clarkson's Farm. So try. Yes, well, I Top Gear. I don't know. Yes, that's uh, the boys. Uh, oh, yeah, not family friendly. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, I haven't done a very good job of keeping this show family friendly. It was sort of my idea to be instructions for young artists and, you know, instruction encouragement for young people starting out in creative fields, uh, you know, and of course, trying mostly to family friendly. Spider, which uh, was good. I made my goal on the Kickstarter there, but I don't know that this has been the best promotional effort. Have the, but uh, all right, well, um, okay, can, can, should we go back to history? So, did you want to talk about prehistory? Is that what you wanted to wanted to bring up? Yes, okay. So, my buddy Phil said he'd been reading an interesting book recently. <laughs> I had him on, he didn't talk about it. I haven't read the book. I mean, I mean, I can't remember what it's called right now, but he said it was about you know, Paleolithic hunter gatherers going on the society that they lived in and how it was quite egalitarian and mm -hmm. not so rigid, like they would plant their crops and. You know, not over farm them, deliberately not right. over farm them, so that mm -hmm. you, know, think, you know, just let them grow up naturally in the wild. And I guess in a less populous world, once you sort of, you know, man is smart enough to easily be able, you know, we pass the point where really hunting the monsters, um, not the monsters, the animals is a very difficult, but I mean, they are sort of like monsters in a way at that point, mm -hmm. that time. You know, they're, they're, they're fairly easily conquered. You know, it requires some skill, but you know, the sort of technology is there. But it's a long, long time before we really have advanced civilization. So how does civilization come about? Well, let's, okay, so let's start with, um, let's start with the Paleolithic. So uh, with the Paleolithic, we have a very long period of time where hunting and gathering is the primary form of sustenance, obviously. And, uh, and what dates is the Paleolithic? Uh, it would, you could start it with the advent of, it depends on how far back you want to go. If you want to start with Homo sapiens, then you're starting before 300,000 years ago. So Homo so, sapiens. Yeah, we think about 300,000 years ago, probably Homo sapiens somewhere. Yeah. But, Homo yeah. sapiens is about, about a third of a million uh, years old. Okay. And so, and so the Paleolithic would end with just speaking simplistically, the end of the last ice age. So uh, the, the end of the last ice age is about 12,000 years ago, i.e. about 10,000 BC. And then at that point, two things happen with the Earth's climate. One is it gets warmer and the other is that it gets more stable. At that point, uh, people start to experiment with very, very basic agriculture. And this, is, this, this would take place in the context of people observing very closely how nature works, how plants grow for a very, very, very long time and conveying this information to each other. Um, so you start to see some farming societies in what's called the hilly flanks, which is uh, the sort of hills near the Fertile Crescent stretching from um, Mesopotamia down to uh, the Levant, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. Um, you see some experiments with with farming, but for thousands and thousands of years after the beginning of this, which is again about 10,000 BC, people are using simultaneous subsistence forms. So they're farming, they're also hunting and gathering, they're trying with crops, they're also gathering wild wheat stands of wheat. The, the important stands of wheat are are in Turkey, for example, that are very very nutritious. There's, there's wild wheat. But there's some experimentation. And then after a while, you start to see, and this is an interesting question, why is hunting and gathering and a nomadic lifestyle sort of abandoned by so many people? The current picture, which is good, I think, is that you start to see sedentism, that is living in one place as opposed to having a nomadic lifestyle before farming starts. You start to see sedentism in places that have naturally very prolific food sources, such as rivers, such as the banks of rivers that are full of salmon and things like that. Sedentism begins in some areas and then people start to rely on 
crop growing more and more as a larger and larger percentage of their um, food intake. And probably they get into what's called the sedentism trap, which is after you start getting more and more um, actual crop growing going on as a larger and larger percentage of your um, of your food sourcing, your population starts to rise because yeah, you're not bringing a hunter gatherers anymore. You're slowly yeah. moving into agriculture. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're still maybe going on hunting trips, but, but that becomes less economically feasible because the, the, the thing is this, and this is one of the things that is extremely crucial to understand a square mile or whatever of land can support much more people. If you're growing grain than if you're just hunting on it. And this is extremely crucial. Okay. And so, What's going to happen is you're starting to have more children. And once once you start to live in a sedentary way and you have very reliable grain as your main source, one of the things that changes demographically is that birth spacing can get smaller. A typical nomadic hunting and gathering band will, a typical woman will have children every four years or so because you don't want to have two children that you have to carry if you're constantly on the go. If you're living in a sedentary site, a sedentary life, you can have a, a woman can have a child every year if she really wants to, and there's a relatively stable amount of food nearby if you're farming wheat or barley or something like that. So you can feed the children. Plus, you always need more people to do little kinds of work around the farm. And if you have those animals that you used to hunt wild cows or something if you start to pen them in with fences then it becomes even easier to get meat because you have a few at all times in some sort of penned in kind of situation instead of having to go out and 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 um hunt them so this, risk your life participate right. in the hero's journey which we've talked right. about last on the show right. you know you have to leave the safety of the hearth right go out and encounter the trials you know meet with the goddess and return right. home having been changed and finding right. everything that has changed yeah right and that's a that's a very joseph campbell way yes. of seeing that and, and <laughs> i want to point out that um he was in decline in the scholarly community for a while. He has been rehabilitated recently in 2012 with a book by Witzel, W-I-T-Z-E-L, called The Origins of the World's Mythologies, which I very, very, the is done. very much recommend. What? I said the souffle is done. Oh, it, it, Tim, that. I was going to ask you about this transition into agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, is there anything weird that happens with the like skeletal records of like whatever yeah. they've been able to recover there, due to agriculture? Is. Yeah, we see we see human stature getting smaller once grain is depended on more. So what we're seeing here is that hunting and gathering produced more a wider variety of nutrients. Once people start to get a larger and larger percentage of their nutrients through grain, they start to get shorter. So it looks very much like uh, grain is less nutritious than the very wide, wide range of things that people were eating um, when they were hunter gatherers. And this is pretty clear in the record. And keep in mind that even if you don't have a full skeleton, you very often have a femur and femurs can be taken as a uh, femur length as a general proxy for overall height. And overall height is generally considered a pretty good proxy for overall health when you're talking about people living at the same time and in the same place as opposed to groups that evolve differently evolve smaller because of limited resources question sir um all right so yes so th this uh, thing of size is a slight, slight digression but um mm -hmm. you know when when um when populations of say animals are sort of trapped on a smaller area right. so unlike in it's sort of like the opposite of what happens in king kong in king kong you have these sort of giant animals trapped in the mm -hmm. but actually they don't lie and actually once you watch king kong you learn that these big animals wipe each other out fairly quickly right and that uh, you know really they get smaller the smaller ones tend to survive in a smaller in a right. smaller area it doesn't right. mean they're less healthy but you're you exactly know, right yeah that yeah. that's why i that's why i made sure to say that when we're talking about groups that have the same sort of resource base and you know in a, in a you know sufficient area if you see at the same time one group that is a little shorter then you probably would guess that they're eating differently but you're absolutely right that if evolutionary pressures exist to that where it's more advantageous to be able to survive with a lower caloric intake 
then it absolutely becomes um, more uh, uh, more successful in a Darwinian terms to be smaller. So you're going to have that in any kind of island environment, you have what's called insular dwarfism. Uh, and so you'll have you'll have the individuals, if they're there long enough, the ones who are smaller and hence require uh, fewer calories, those th th they, they will do very well there. So it does not indicate that they are, um, you know, that they're that they're poorly, poorly fed or something like that. Um, all right. Do you want to talk about the growth of actual what we could call civilization um from... yes okay well, yes yeah. i do one question first though so yes so so ten thousand bc so I, I, that was a good movie uh but we can talk about <laughs> that was i enjoyed it though um but um you know i, I like that better how far spread was homo sapiens at that point have we already sort of spread out around the globe or yeah not? it's very very spread because remember that um he, uh, Homo sapiens had gone all the way to Australia by 60,000 BC. So this, as you mentioned earlier, was along the yeah. Yeah, along the coastline. So, you know, something like the Red Sea along the coast of India and then, you know, east into Southeast Asia. And then from there going over to um, going over to New Guinea and 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 Australia. So that's that's, you know really, really quite early. So by this, and, and, and humans had gotten to, to the Americas by, by 18,000 BC, um, probably across early. the Bering Strait, across the, yeah. the, so that, that, yes. the Bering Strait would have just seemed like a big expanse of snowy land. So yes. And then it opened up if they and they it. passed through. And I saw an interesting thing, right? The, uh, the Native Americans on PBS, the history of Native Americans saying how they all shared a very common mythology. Right. that was sort of developed up there and then very quickly people spread through north and south america you know yeah yes I, I would definitely look at witzel that book that i just recommended the origins of the world's mythologies by witzel 2012 and and again yeah. he he harkens back to some of campbell's joseph campbell's most interesting work on trying to trace uh, mythical forms from siberia over to sort of alaska and the pacific northwest which is yeah. really interesting stuff Yes, he was looking at all no, different Tim. religions, Joseph Campbell. And I think, you know, I don't know, like, yes, the sort of what he was doing later on, he was sort of doing more popularized. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how much it came from, like, sort of George Lucas, you know, using him for Yoda, right. you know, to create the wisdom of Yoda. He used Joseph Campbell and sort of distilled it down to the most sort of simple form, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and he was quite influenced by all that. And the whole thing is like a sort of hero's journey story. And yeah. then, you know, then the power of myth shows that were sort of taped were taped at Lucas Ranch. And, you know, then he sort of gets a little more sort of in the popular conscious, you know, PBS start really loving him, <laughs> you know, yeah. and that, that's a sort of different thing. But, you know, yeah, he certainly, certainly, you know, well, that's how it went for me, you know, sort of Star Wars, Yoda, Lewis Campbell, it sort of just leads into other things. He's a good, he's a good sort of gateway drug, I think. I would agree with you completely. And and keep in mind, some, some of the Joseph Campbell books are very, very good before he you know, made it big and relaxed. It's kind of like Frank Sinatra, where the early stuff is really kind of good, and then it just gets like, da, 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 I'm wealthy now, I don't really care. Um, so, yeah, that's how I said it. That's how I said it. Don't worry, you'll, you'll get there one day. <laughs> so I had, I had a question about this 60,000 years. Did you say 60,000 years ago, people were in Australia? I sure did, yeah. Does does that mean that they sailed there? I assume the continents were roughly the same That's, as they are today. Yeah, the continents were the same, except that you. Okay, so th this is a great question. Uh, the, the most important book is called the first on this topic is the First Mariners by a guy named Bednarik, B E D N A R I K. Bednarik is pointing out in that book that we have evidence of sailing voyages, e like long ones, even before Homo sapiens. <laughs> so sailing is apparently what? yes. <laughs> It's a really interesting topic. The first mariner. That's okay? insane. Yeah, Bednarik. Um, I have the book. I have yeah. the. I have yeah. the book right here. Um, okay, this feeds into my wading apes again. I think you know. Yeah. I just think we're like dolphins. We spend <laughs> yeah. lots of time in the water. We've got slightly webbed fingers. You know, we, you, we, you know, we're, we're good at it. We love it. We love the beach. We love the water. That's what we want to do on our day off. Yeah, absolutely. So, 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 and, and keep in mind that that. I mean, sailing is obviously extremely old, but also, I mean, just to show a comparatively old thing, 
I don't know if either of you know how ridiculously old the domestication of fire is. It predates Homo sapiens. It's Homo erectus that first learned to oh. domesticate fire. This is at least 800,000 years ago. So I was going to say like a million years. Yeah. 800,000 years ago. Yeah, so Prometheus was like way back. <laughs> Prometheus probably was a giant gorilla. You know, the Titans, they would refer to them as the Titans, weren't they? They probably were Titans back then. Maybe they, like in the Bible, they lived 700 years. <laughs> I'm just still trying to get my head around this idea of when we started sailing the ocean or yeah. navigating the ocean. What was the date on that again? That, okay, it's so before... that's that. Yeah, that. that so, okay, so so the evidence would be this: um, you have some islands like Crete that have pre-Homo sapiens remains there. Okay, hmm. you have you have you have hominins on Crete. And Crete kit could not be reached um, ex uh, except through sailing. Okay, so that that would be a big one. Um, ooh, ooh, so ooh, we're, I've, we're any... now. I've got monkeys on a boat. That's even yeah. You're... Are there are there any like uh, <laughs> like boat. remains of the vessels, or it's just the bones? <laughs> No, it's just the bones, but there's no other easy way for people yeah, right, to, for, right. for I... see humans to have gotten this far. So vessels would be made of something very, um, you know, breakable and degradable, like you know, wood planks and things like that. So that that's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, there's certainly some sea crossings to get to get to Australia. Uh, and the thing is that the people that went to Australia, they probably, well, they probably had um, a wider, let's just put it this way. It seems that their toolkit kind of narrowed down after a while. Um, and, you know, it, it, the, the, the Aboriginal Australians never developed something like farming and that they didn't really need to because they had all that they needed there just hunting and gathering. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting um, that's an interesting sort of thing to think about. People don't necessarily need to switch over to farming uh, if they're happy with what they've got that they don't necessarily need to. So the question is, why did all of these other people's develop farming and then come to rely upon farming to the point that they essentially abandon hunting and gathering. And there's a lot of interesting theories about this. And one would be that there's competition from other groups outside. And it's probably since it is a fact that farming produces higher populations per square unit of land than hunting and gathering does. What we might assume is that these kinds of farming settlements found it advantageous to produce larger groups of people to defend themselves against other farming settlements and against other pastoralists, mobile pastoralists and hunting and gather and hunter gatherers. So a kind of military strength would occur from having a larger population. If you have similar technologies, with all other things being equal, generally in the sort of ancient world, a larger population will equal more military power. So this probably mm -hmm. has something to do with the origin of what we would call the state. Something yes, like very this. The rise of what we've been calling the blue squares, you know, well, really the sort of sociopathic people <laughs> who are like stir people up. But, you know, like they have, they have more of a hard time nowadays. They're really doubling that, tripling down on everything because they know we're onto them. But um you know, back then they could you could get pretty crazy, couldn't you? You could uh, you could whip people up into quite a frenzy, and atrocious things would happen. Sure, it's yeah. Um, I was going to say Elon Musk kind of has an interesting take on technology. Where um, I hope I'm getting this right. He doesn't assume that technology is something that necessarily marches forward. You have to put in an effort. And you have to kind of make it um, like a cultural priority. And if you don't do that, you can actually that that it's not a given that technology evolves forward. It can yeah. actually like stagnate or go backwards. I thought, well, that's interesting because I always thought, you know, it would automatically just get better and better and better. If people, uh, but maybe not. If people lose, if a population loses it, that would be sort of like losing the ability to write, which has happened many times in, in history. You know, the obvious one would be the, the Bronze Age collapse with the Mycenaeans literally not producing any writing at all. Uh, no writing appears in Greece for 400 years after the Bronze Age collapse until the alphabet is realized. So you can lose a, tech, a population can, can easily lose a technology. And that's uh, one of my favorite books is uh, Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut. Where mm -hmm. so the, the remaining survivors of the human, they were people on a cruise and they get marooned on the Galapagos Islands, and the story is told by a ghost. And oh, after, well. like, after some millions of years, 
you know, the last the human humans, the descendants of humans have sort of evolved into these sort of fur like seals, f- furry seals that flop around on the beach. Oh, I should read that. Wow. Yeah, there's, there's, a, great, there's a horrible great, disaster. Yeah. <laughs> there's a horrible disaster that they don't really uh it's years since i've read it but uh that something happens and this ship uh that is basically like gets out into the ocean seeds the galapagos yes and uh then it's being told from the point of like i don't know how how long how much uh evolution since the shipwreck there i, I can't remember it's like millions of years like the ghost has sort of told yeah. this story and then the ghost is sort of like okay well i'm ready i'm ready to leave this world now but he sort of stuck around to sort of see what would happen and Basically, this last vestige of humanity are now these sort of furry seals flopping about on the beach. Well, you know, in in the Time Machine by H.G. Wells, again from 1895, he there was a chapter that eventually got removed for some reason. I can't remember the story, um, but there's a chapter where you know the the time traveler. You know, first he's in that that yeah he, he that, got there first yes. He, well, first first he, he's in the society of the Eloi and the Morlocks, and then he goes forward and forward and forward and forward. And at one point he sees these. I can't remember what they are. They're there's some sort of furry things like yeah the future you know, I did a drawing of them. I have a drawing. I did I did this. Yeah, but 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 the, the book actually I would argue gets more interesting after the Morlock and Eloi thing. Because he he goes way into the future, and the sun is starting to turn into a red giant, and there's there are these creatures on the beach, and he sort of examines them. And he realizes that they were oh that's great, that they were actually descendants of human beings. Yeah, that's great. But but, but remember that <laughs> the Eloi are not described as having clothing of any sort, are they? I can't remember. Oh, um, future Eloi, that's creepy. Yeah, the future Eloi. I they like sort of come down. I just sort of like these were very quick little doodles based on his descriptions. But yeah, I like so that the, a lot. E- the Eloi was sort of smaller. They, yes, I think they were wrapped in the robes and, you know, they had like these sort of narrow eyes, narrow faces. They're right. short, they're blonde. Right. Like the Morlock also had sort of blonde hair, but they've got sort of dark skin. They're very ragged. They have big black eyes. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. But the future Eloi also seems to have evolved these sort of more animal-like kind of eyes. Right. You know, oh, that's right. And going back and they're now going around on all fours and they're sort of covered in like white fur. And they and, probably lost most of their intelligence. Yes, yes, and they, they, they've lost their intelligence. So yes, so he did. He did get there first with that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty great. Wow, I like those illustrations a lot. That's great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that was something. Tim, a do you different. think I there's did. any I, chance? I, I good, yeah. <laughs> you think there's any chance we'll get back in the water, like you know, like uh, like um, like whales did? You know, like they're in the water, they're out of the water, they're back in the water. Like we you think we'll do up, anything we would, like that? Well, we would give up some essential technologies such as fire. If we go back in the mm. water, but um, I don't know. They're, at the end of, I don't know if you've read uh, Bruce Sterling's book Schismatrix. That was that. It's a really good one. It's it's along the same lines as cyberpunk as um, William Gibson Neuromance. Not as well written as oh, yeah. Neuromance, but in Schismatrix, at the very there, there's a version you can get called that something like Schismatrix Plus or something. Where the main character at the end, um, he's lived for a couple hundred years, kind of like Louis Wu from Ringworld. And he's lived for a couple hundred years and he ends up um, finding a, a way to sort of be physically transformed into a kind of intellectual dolphin swimming in the waters of, I think it was under the ice of Io or something like that. And that's Ooh, that's, yes. the, that's the next phase that he wants to do is is put his consciousness into a sort of dolphin with hands and just swim under under the yeah so i don't know yeah that's a good question i would imagine that if you if you had if we ever got to the point where we spread human beings to many 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 different places whatever that um we would certainly um you would see speciation occurring so you would see you know you would see Mm -hmm. beings that were homo sapiens diverging if they lived in very very different environments uh for long enough for enough number of generations and then if there was a very like watery Mars. environment that, that could happen i guess there was a very interesting I was idea thinking about recently. mars this, this, this is another little diversion it's a good sh- short story uh going around recently science fiction short story about like you know ais and robots and uh you know it's sort of told from the point of view of uh you know um Kind of flashback there's a woman sort of trapped on a sort of wrecked spaceship she's trying to protect her child and do something uh but you sort of learn the history again all in the short story of uh you know the rise of the ais they got to a certain point but at a certain point they got 
they, they sort of when, when they reach consciousness, they suddenly they can't operate if a human is not in the room to observe them. You know, there's something about human consciousness that the machines can't replicate. And, you know, he's got us all good to a quantum. You know, it's, it's just exploring this idea. But yes, yeah, so like they're, they're fine up to a level. But at some point, then suddenly they stop to operate when humans are out. So then now they need humans. And so now they, you know, now we're far in the future and they've taken humans. They've devolved humans down into just their essential organs that they carry wow. around inside them. You know, and like a backpack or what? Yes, like a backpack. So we're like now, so rather than like us sort of living inside them in a sort of, you know, we're like their slaves. We're only there to sort of, you know, observe them. Well, they, now, they, don't they, the Cybermen okay. or the Daleks or someone like that have like a, a human inside or is yeah, that? Yeah, that's different. Yes, the Daleks have, yeah, the Cybermen are, uh, yes, Dalek and Cybermen are all, so they're, so they're a bit more like Cybermen, I suppose. Okay. The, yes, the human, you know, the Dalek is a sort of, uh, was a human-like creature, but now it's evolved into a sort of blobby, tentacly thing. You know, okay. It doesn't have any emotions except for hate, and it drives around right. its own personalized little tank. I'm still scared by that. <laughs> yeah, it's a very terrifying concept. You know, anybody driving a car is somewhat a Dalek. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, like road uh, rage. You know, but the Cybermen are humans that they've sort of like the cyber technology has sort of overtaken them, and now they're sort of subsumed, and that they're a sort of automaton. And then the, 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 the machinery. but they also they got the Toclophane. Who, do you remember the Toclophane? They are spherical metal things that the master has harnessed against oh. the doctor. And they have they have a human inside, or yeah, they have a kind of uh, very future human inside them as well. Yes. Okay, yes, I don't remember those. Yes, yeah, so maybe that's the idea is like... It all, all ideas sort of go around, especially with something that's been around as long as Doctor Who has definitely yeah. explored a lot of territory. But yeah, this yeah. was just quite kind of, this was sort of basing it more on the sort of quantum physics that they needed us, you know, but now we were just sort of evolved into our sort of essential sensory organs oh, okay. that they keep sort of kind of in wow. a jar. That is, that is yeah. terrifying. But it was a very creepy little story. Yeah. And, you know, you can see like, very yeah, like codependent kind of story. story. Codependent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> These. Oh yes, yeah. so, okay. Dale, Dale's uh, jumping in now. Now we got into Doctor Who. We're getting into Dale's areas of expertise here. I didn't really watch Torchwood. Is I didn't Torchwood watch. Torchwood. Torchwood. I, want, I wanted to. I, I'd like to start. I've only gotten interested in Doctor Who in the last year or so because my fiance mm -hmm. really likes Doctor Who, and we've been watching it with the kids. And some of the episodes are scary, like the Weeping Angels one. Scared, oh yes, scared both of my kids a little bit. Um, so yeah. Yes, they should, should, there was definitely an episode. There was an episode where <laughs> it was like a Tom Baker episode. Where I was quite young, I was, but I was quite enjoying Doctor Who at that point. I think I'd watched Doctor Who probably all my life up to that point. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember. But all of a sudden, he was on a space station, and they had some little thing that they'd taken, and they enlarged it, and it grew, and it was this weird, like, shrimp-like thing. It looked like a shrimp. <laughs> Sort of, but it suddenly grew big, and I was so terrified, and I just couldn't. And that's it. And then I couldn't watch Doctor Who again, you know, forever. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so silly. How old are your kids? Okay. I'm, I'm going to find it. Mine are 15 and 10. Yeah, I mean, my it was it was interesting. Like when my daughter was uh, young, the stuff that scared her it was kind of hard to anticipate. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that I thought would be totally benign did scare her. Um, Maybe I'm just hardened. I remember the scaredest that I've ever been. I was about I was about 10 and I was in Long Island in a house that my family had rented for a few weeks. And there was a book there on Appalachian ghost stories. And <laughs> there was a story about this young man who was going to marry this young woman. And then he went off to war. Oh God! And then, and then he lost. <laughs> what is that? That was the thing on Doctor Who that terrified. Oh, that's the shrimp thing. It was like a small thing, and then they put it in this like thing to make it grow, or it got in this thing, and it's like growing bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was this wow. horrible thing. It's oh, like sea monkeys. It's kind of scary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was. It was very. <laughs> and meanwhile, Doctor Who himself had like he was undergoing something. Like he was face was all covered in this sort of like white kind of meshy stuff. So he was oh. going to be able to un uh, not able to deal with this horrible thing. They they did pretty well for the fact that they had such a small per, uh, special effects budget, you know. Oh yeah, they were very creative. I mean, they probably yeah. used a shrimp. Some of the scariest <laughs> stuff. 
<laughs> I mean, there are those zombie movies that all came out maybe 10, 15 years ago, and there was an American version called I Am Legend with Will Smith. Right. And then there was like 28 Days, uh, the yeah. like kind of British version. Yeah. And by far, the low budget British version was more terrifying, in my opinion. And they just used traditional. I, I mean, I'm not a special effects guy, but it looked like very traditional stuff. There wasn't a lot of CGI, maybe, maybe no CGI, but those were some terrifying zombies. I loved 28 Days Later a lot. I really, really like that movie. Uh, that that was um, Killian or Cillian Murphy. Um, that was his breakout role, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and then the, the sequel, 28 Weeks Later, I enjoyed that. I actually enjoyed the sequel more for some reason. I don't know why, yes, but I did. That had that one that. guy, Robert, who was the main character? He was also in Train. Yeah, Robert Carlyle, yeah. Yeah, the thing is, I hated him so oh. much in Train Spotting. I mean, I hated yes. his character so much in Train Spotting that I couldn't yes, he... put him in 28 Weeks Later, which is not really fair of me. No, it's confusing because he did, did a, a really nice, one of his early work was this show in Scotland, like a policeman. He was like a policeman in rural, remote Scotland called uh -huh. Hamish Macbeth. And that's a really cute sort of series. Okay. Um, oh. Yeah, I really recommend Hamish Macbeth if you want to sort of live. It's sort of like a northern exposure sort of oh, okay. feel to it or whatever. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's good. And, and all in Scotland. Um, so I recommend that. But yeah, and he does a lot of work on TV shows. I think he's most well known for... Um, I haven't really watched it. One of those Once Upon a Time shows or something like that, where they <laughs> suddenly there were like two shows based on fairy tales seem to get very popular. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. But yeah, he had one of those, and then he's been in a Stargate series. So he's got some. He's got some US TV show, show money now. He must be doing oh, good. Well. That's that's good. That that will represent you know monetary freedom for him, which is good. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I think once you do that, once you get on a British TV show, you're set. I mean, American TV show. British yeah, TV yeah. show, you're not that set. But you get on no, like American a long TV show, you have, American show. American yeah. show, you have, a, you have a million episodes and there's a million reruns and you get you get money each time it, get, it gets shown. So it's a good deal. So it can be very difficult, actually. Um, uh, he, uh, anyway, I've, never, I've never really watched this show called uh, Touched by an Angel with like Michael Landon. But uh, the guy who uh, made the yeah. Angel of Death on that show was, uh, uh, he was a friend of a... Uh, 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 it was a friend of my, uh, my wife's brother and um you know they were quite close friends really and he got very successful like with the show made loads of money but then when it was over he became very depressed you know you could never do anything else yeah oh that's quite, sad. It was, yeah it was, it was very interesting you, you mean because he got typecast i think he got typecast it was funny like people who watch i don't know that show is not shown here really in the bay area but it's very popular around the country you know okay. so, you know it's one of those sort of very sort of hit, heartland no, no. Christian morality sort of shows, I think. And he wasn't really <laughs> yeah, that Michael guy. Landon, that, that was a death, great role right? for him. Yeah. But it ended up, that was like prime time like TV. So oh, I remember Michael Landon his Little House on the Prairie. Yes. Yeah, he was he good in that, that too. <laughs> yeah. My sister used to like it. I, I for years, it. for you know how Michael Landon in that show wore his hair kind of like over his ears? For years, my dad would joke to me when I was a little boy. He'd say, you know, you know why he wears his hair over his ears like that? And I was like, no, dad, why? And he goes, because his ears were cut off in a terrible accident. So I believe that because <laughs> my dad was a huge joker. So I believe and he was completely deadpan in his delivery at all times. So I believe that for years until some my sister or something. Like, no, he does. You know, no, no. I love playing tricks Sounds like, like that. That's bad. That's really amusing. They they fall, fall for it every time. <laughs> yeah, my dad took me to see Jaws right. when it was in the theaters, and I'm sure he thought that was hilarious. And That's I was like scary. seven. Too scary. Yeah, my parents. I were, uh, they didn't they didn't take yeah. me to see so. Wait, because you went to see Jaws. Sure it was seven. hilarious for him. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sure my stepdad thought it was hilarious because it terrified me. And I swear to as a seven year old, I'd never get in the ocean, you know, and I had to walk out in the middle of it. You know, when the captain's getting bit in half by the shark, I was like, Dad, can we go? I don't think so it's I never funny. actually it's saw the end. I don't, think was I don't think that's funny to do. Uh, I, don't I didn't either. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I, I would never do that to someone. No, he he had kind of a dark sense of humor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't do that to a child. Yeah, but the thing is, actually, yeah. well, I didn't you think don't actually funny. see that much. It's all in the imagination, you know. It's all in the directors. Like you know, they couldn't even make the shark work in that movie. You know, everything. I don't know. You should watch it again, Shark. There's plenty that you think it's going to happen. But there's still yeah. plenty of fear. Hey. 
there's oh well there's a severed head that pops out at you that's pretty graphic oh yeah there's there's the person that gets, inside the body the, yeah but it pops out after yeah. after all this like you're swimming around in the murk you can't quite see anything you know if you just it saw totally that takes head, you off guard. Like, uh, whatever but it's the way it pops out at you after, <laughs> after all this suspense yeah that's you. great well, they start playing the music, you know, the music starts very slowly. You're like, why? Get, get back in the boat. Get back in the boat. Uh -huh. And then I think uh, he finds a tooth and that kind of distracts you. He finds this giant tooth. And then right after that, when you're focused on the tooth, the head pops out. Um, oh. right, Dale, oh, Dale's here saying, yes, yes. <laughs> Dale's saying, oh, good. How old were you, Dale? Dale? That was later. Chris was seven. Uh, How old were you, Dale? Dale's older. He's older than no, us. Because Alien came out earlier old. than anyone actually realized. Alien came out in 1974. What? 79. Alien came out oh. in 79. It feels like it's from about 85, but it's actually from 79. That's, yeah, it's, it's that's what I thought. Everyone realizes. Aliens, that was a classic. I just rewatched Alien. Oh, he was 12-ish. Okay, so that's not as bad as being 7-ish, right? Okay, good. But that's... that's yeah. Alien's guess, pretty bad, too. Yeah, but that was so well done. So I I, I give that one a pass because it was so superb. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to get traumatized as a kid, you want it to be a high-caliber movie. Yes, exactly. Like, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. If you're going to swear off the ocean, do it for... Yeah, so, but really the, the whole point is that kids can appreciate a low caliber movie because mm -hmm. they've not seen it before. That's the thing. And then when you show them later, show them a classic, they're very bored because they've seen it all before. They're like, okay, you, you know, any movie, you know, that was great, then everybody rips it off and reuses it and does it and puts it in cartoons and all this. So by the time they see it, they're like, well, what's so special about this? Yeah, that's that's what happened to my friend. She had never actually read 1984, but she'd read every single dystopian novel afterwards. And so when she finally got to 1984 at the age of 45, she's like, I don't get it. What's the big deal? And I'm like, oh, because I read 1984 when I was 10. So I was like, Ooh. and I've read it. I've read it many, 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 many times since then. And so I was like, it's the greatest thing ever. And she was thinking like Handmaid's Tale, all these other dystopian fictions had come out since then. So 1984 was just sort of old hat. And I'm like, damn, that's... I mean, yes. to me, okay. the most amazing thing about that was when you read it and it was done in what, the 40s? It was done in 1948. Yes. I yes, mean, so I'm going to say this. It's, it, it could have been done last year. I mean, I, I just, and I read it really late too, but I still liked it. I read it in my thirties, I think. And, uh, uh, I apparently, I somehow didn't get forced to read it in college, but, um, but yeah, I just, I, I just thought, man, people have not changed that much. Propaganda has not changed that much. I agree with you. Yes. Like, I, I, I would basically read it in high school. Um, and this actually is going to relate back. I had quite a good English teacher. I quite enjoyed reading it. We did a, we did a good review, but we did, had to compare and contrast it to a book by William Golding, who wrote Lord of the Flies. But we right. didn't do it against Lord of the Flies. We did it with um, this other book he wrote called The Inheritors, which is okay. a kind of a clan of the cave bears, a predecessor okay. clan of the cave bears. It's about a tribe of humans encountering a tribe of Neanderthals. Um, so, you know, that sort of, that, that sort of, connects into some of the things we were saying earlier. Yes, yeah, so we had to sort of, you know, contrast the, this one story of that with this. And I, you know, I'm probably way too young, probably do a better job of it now, but it was quite an enjoyable project trying to sort of draw parallels and similarities between, you know, what's this, you know, two sort of older books, but both writing, one writing about the far past and one writing mm -hmm. about the future. The and, near future, uh, yeah. yeah different themes are involved oh but dale is bringing up one of my favorite movies ever zardoz uh -oh. oh zardoz oh i right. love zardoz so much and okay, i think I'm, i might bring zardoz. dale on here if we, if we, talk, like, we haven't really we haven't really got into zardoz yet do you want to talk about zardoz shall i have you got some more time tim who me yeah 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 you got some, okay i'm gonna send I'm only gonna, for zardoz yeah dale, yeah, dale recommended this i haven't seen it yet i've watched Boston the trailers Venice. I watched Circle of Iron, I think. Um, is that what it's called? The David Carradine one, Circle of Iron? I don't know. Dale, I watched that movie. Uh, Do I get a, a gold sticker or something? <laughs> but I have not seen Zardoz yet. Zardoz is Sean Connery in his wildest outfit yet. <laughs> <laughs> and it involves a it invo oh yeah but you know what's funny you're not you're, lot, not, you're of, not selling me so far <laughs> a lot of people who who love zardoz are ashamed to admit it because there's so many zardoz haters out there but in zardoz it's a it's a society a few hundred years in the future 
there's a group called the barbarians who, and Sean Connery is one of those and they will constantly destroy stuff. And there's tiny, tiny, tiny little settlements of these psychically active humans who live in sort of aristocratic, but slightly hippie ish lifestyle. Um, and they control the, or what, some of them control the barbarians through a giant flying stone head uh, where, that gives commands to the barbarians saying things like, the gun is good and, and procreation is evil and things like that. It, it, it's, it's absolutely bizarre. I'm actually due for another watching of it. It's been, it's been about, it's been about 18 years since I've seen that. Okay, Dale watches it like every week. Well, every, when you every day, the actually. way you describe it seems like it's relevant to today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> A like, little bit, like 1984 too. Yes, yes. All right. I, I, well, hopefully, I don't know. He's gone quiet now, but hopefully, he will. Uh, <laughs> he will join us. But yes, that is the one. Oh, here he is. Here he is. All right, there we go. All right, Dale. Thank you for joining us, Dale. Great. Yes. Yeah, so we found another Zardoz <laughs> fan. It's just amazing. I'm amazed when we found all these heard of Zardoz. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's a little obscure at this point, isn't it? Yeah. Dale's mm. showing, showing us his. Oh, head. wow. Look at Is that a fez with, Zar yes, with Zardoz? Fez. Oh, yeah. That's something you guys have in common. You're both known to wear fezes. Yeah, I do wear a fez once in a while, but I don't have a Zardoz fez. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to grab a hat. Hold on for <laughs> one second, please. It's not a fez. Oh, but it's a it's a hey, Dale, you know, I have, uh, I have one of those pins. I have a spare one of those ones that you gave me. Like I, Tina, Tina, Tina has uh, passed up on hers, so I, I still have it. I think I'm going to. Or maybe I'll send it to Tim. Is there a Zardoz connection with the um, episode of um, Rick and Morty where there's that giant head that appears and yeah, that's, do a talent show? that's ripped off from Zardoz. Okay, so there's like two. Well, There's like that crazy society that separates the males with a. With that's a, not uh, exactly Zardoz. It's called? the floating head. That's the. the uh, yep. And, Tim, what is uh, on your head now? You got. <laughs> turban. What do you call that? This is a turban. It's a turban. All right. Okay. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> Does that mean it comes <laughs> comes uh, undone? Can you roll that out? No, it's it's a perma. You don't have to. Perma, perma turban. Yeah, it's, it's like stapled somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wear a fez because I don't right. like t-shirts. I, so I just buy pins and I put them all on the fez. Good. The good, only good. Like, disadvantage like is that <laughs> sometimes the backing to the pins fall off. So I put the fez on and the pins go straight into my head. That is not pleasant. It's a it's a risk I'm willing to take though. So yes. I'm looking for a funny hat. So mm -hmm. you're a big fan of Zardoz. Well, I haven't seen it in 18 years, but I certainly grew up watching it from teenage, teenage onward. Right? <laughs> you grew up watching Very much. Zardoz. Um, that explains a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, um, I keep it on my phone. <laughs> you keep the, the movie Zardoz on your phone? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, there we go. Charlotte Rampling. Well, I'm a big fan of hers. Oh, yes. Let me tell you. Let me yeah, tell you. She's, she's got even more popular now. She recently played uh, Reverend Mother. Um, yes, Gaius Moynihan. Moin 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 yes, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite know how to pronounce it. I'm not very good at name, but like when I read a book, I sort of don't really pronounce the names in my head. I just sort of recognize them, and then I always pronounce them wrong. But you can barely see her face in the new Dune because she has that black net front yep. of it she's almost unrecognizable she also was in the final season of dexter and she did a wonderful job on that um not the most recent um sequel but the final season of the original dexter she she was a oh, yeah player. yeah she's kind of become the affordable helen mirren yeah i guess so <laughs> uh, but yes all right yes well her and helen mirren I, I, they're probably friends but yeah I, yes hmm, who do we like better but um, i i, I, I around and sexier than helen mirren Stardust once a month Wow, you'd have a chance. I think you'd have a chance with Charlotte Ramp. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you understand what the movie's about, right, Timothy? How are you? How are you defining what it's about? Well, it's about. Do you know what the? Um, do you know what the simulation hypothesis is? Is the simulation hypothesis something that the universe is actually a simulation, and we think that we're alive, or something like that? Yeah, that we live in a computer program. Right. I don't okay. actually think that's true, though. Well, a computer program. 
Hmm. The whole movie Zardoz is about mm -hmm. that. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, like, do you remember when the movie opens? I mean, we're living in a computer program. It was written by a company like Whenever that. Whenever what? It was do you remember when the movie opens one. and <laughs> yeah. Arthur Frayne mm -hmm. tells you that he's an app, that he's a character in a movie? He's and there's full of lie, of irony and contradictions. Yeah. Yeah, and they're doing it all for the entertainment of the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you read about the simulation hypothesis, mm -hmm. the idea is as we develop AIs, mm -hmm. it may be possible for an AI to see the source code mm -hmm. of the simulation that we live in. Mm -hmm. And that's actually getting a little closer to reality because there are now there's a, a proposed experiment to determine whether or not the fifth state of matter is commu is communication information mm -hmm. now does so, Neil deGrasse Tyson think that we might be living in an ancestor sim simulation there's people who talk about the simulation <laughs> hypothesis but <laughs> the movie do you remember the tabernacle the AI that runs the mm -hmm. vortex I love that part okay and the 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 uh, tabernacle uses friend and Arthur Frayne mm -hmm. to breed Zed to mm -hmm. destroy the tap. So you're with me so far, right? 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 Okay. The reason the tabernacle did that is because the tabernacle realized that it lives inside of a movie. Okay, that's interesting. So the whole idea of Zardoz is that the characters in the film, Zed and the Tabernacle, mm -hmm. are trying to escape the movie. Okay. And most people miss that. I think I've missed that. I, 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 I think I definitely missed that. So you want Tell to watch. Connery was definitely trying to escape it. <laughs> after, after it well, was do you remember this <laughs> scene where <laughs> Sean Connery goes to the periphery shield? Yep. And he pushes his hands yeah, and yeah, I get through. Yeah. Yeah. He's not trying to get through the periphery shield. Mm -hmm. He's pushing against the other side of the screen, trying right. to yes, break he's the very fourth definitely, wall. Yes, he's pushing right up against your screen. Okay. Yes. I'm going to have to watch again with this in mind. That's yeah. very interesting. And That's very interesting. The thing is, after Zed realizes that he lives in a movie, mm -hmm. he's able to control it. So okay. after he pretends to kill the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that scene where he rewinds time. Yes. He's just rewinding the film. Then what about when he's a skeleton at the end with what's that's, that's the thing is he escapes the movie by creating a montage at the mm -hmm. end. Okay. And that's his escape. The tabernacle. So he quickly whizzes through the end of the last bit of his life. He lives happily, quickly lives happily ever after. Right. Okay. okay. Now, do you remember? Do you remember the when after he supposedly destroys the tabernacle, and he has that big jewel, and he gives it to uh, May to take with her followers out of the to out of take the, with them little city out of their little their settlement. Yeah, do you remember yeah, that? Part? I think I think so. Actually, I'm not sure if I remember that, but, I, but I'll take your word for it. That's how the tabernacle escapes. So okay. the tabernacle's in the crystal. It's in the crystal. Okay, no, that, that right. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. The tabernacle escapes by going off screen, mm -hmm. and Zed escapes by um, a montage where he dies. Now I know that sounds ridiculous. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's a ridiculous. Right? Yeah. But do you have you looked at all of the movies Sean Connery did after that where he fakes his own death? No. So he he um is thought to be dead in the rock and then okay. fakes his own death in the rock. Okay. In uh Highlander and Highlander 2. He's immortal. Mm -hmm. In uh, Sword of the Valiant, where he's the Green Knight, he's immortal. In uh, Hunt for Red October, he fakes his own death. Interesting. And as Zed, he, did it, he did it before. He did it in James Bond, too. Right. In, Zed in 
escape the movie Zardoz uh -huh. by becoming Sean Connery. He evolved to a higher plane of existence. But this is starting to sound like kind of conspiracy theory level stuff, though. Like, like people yeah. they have, they have, they have, they have, people people like <laughs> Uh, he's uh, he's a fourteen expert as well. So yeah, so uh, Dale, uh, yeah, he, he'll communicate. He'll tell us if your conspiracy theory is believable or ridiculous or not. Okay. So <laughs> it's so the thing is, there are nested. The whole point of the movie Zardoz is to show there are nested realities, okay. and that we're characters within them, mm -hmm. and that we can, if we realize that we live in a fake reality, mm -hmm. then we can evolve and get out of it mm -hmm. now did you ever read the comic strip peanuts when you were growing up I, well, all the time do you do you remember the character snoopy of course okay have you read peanuts from the beginning and watched snoopy evolve from the first strip to the last strip not closely but i've, okay. I've seen a lot of the early like 1950s ones okay if you look at the first strips, Snoopy is just a voiceless, walks on four legs. I remember that part. Puppy, yeah. and mm -hmm. quite a little puppy. You know, he's yeah. like you know he's sort of dogmatic size from Astrid. Yeah. You know, he's sort of quite a little. Now boy. he evolves, and the reason he evolves is because the readers liked him, mm -hmm. so Scholes concentrated on him. And that created a feedback loop. So mm -hmm. he would, uh, the reader's interest would uh, get uh, Schulz's interest, which would result in the evolution of Snoopy. Yes, eventually he has a thought. And then, he's you know, thoughts, he has a he's thought, bipedal. He has a yeah. And then and he started able to do paranormal things, like his doghouse is bigger on the inside. He can manifest sweaters and briefcases and little Zambonis mm -hmm. to resurface the ice. Snoopy becomes the Neo of the Peanuts Matrix. That's fascinating. <laughs> and, and the sop with camel. If yes. you look at the popularity of Snoopy, he starts affecting our reality. Mm -hmm. Snoopy was in the Louvre. Mm -hmm. Snoopy was a symbol that they carried on the Apollo space missions. Mm -hmm. He's known all over the world. So his impact evolving from a lower reality character surviving Scholz's death and now still influencing this higher reality. So the lesson is you want to be entertaining to the higher dimensional readers mm -hmm. that are watching us now. Mm -hmm. The so robot, that's our robot descendants that. in the future, they'll be scanning through all this data and finally putting it together to make some sense out of it. Very, yeah. very interesting. That's but, very good. So Snoopy and Zed are both telling the same message about learning that you live in a fake reality and that allows you to begin to manipulate it. Very, very Zed, interesting. Zed has the advantage because he's the main character of the movie. So mm -hmm. the viewers immediately are concentrating on him. So does that make sense? That's an interesting theory. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I have to get going because I have another. Yeah. <laughs> no, I like and, that. And I, I like that. I like the theory. I like the theory. And I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch Zardoz <laughs> again. But I do like the theory. So I have a faculty meeting-ish thing at 10.15, so I have to jump off right now, but it's yes. very nice to talk to you, Dale. No, thanks for staying so long, Tim. Uh, no, that's thanks, great. Man. We appreciate to have so right. much of your time, and you've been really helpful and you know, put a oh, great my, perspective on everything. My, my, that pleasure, my pleasure. And I learned a lot. Good times, folks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cheerio. Cheerio, Tim. All right, it's great. Thank, uh, thank you, guys. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be – yeah, that was, that was very fun. Thank you, Dale, for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Last why why doesn't it say Zardov expert on your uh, your caption there? We got to change that. <laughs> because I have still much to learn. Really That's why I watch it every student. I watch student of Zardoz. I can. Student yeah. of Zardoz. How about that? I need to get the the helmet, but it's expensive. Yes. Mm, oh yeah. Yes, the yes, um, yeah. <laughs> We can replace you with a helmet. Well, that maybe that could be something you do in character animator. That would be quite easy. Just have a mouth that goes up and down. <laughs>
But uh, Dale, are you going to come back later today again? When four o'clock. Yeah, four o'clock. We're going to speak yeah. to Jason Thompson, who's quite famous for doing uh, D and D maps, like walkthrough maps of all classic D and D modules. Beautiful art he does. Uh, Chris, you're welcome to come back then too if you want, but you may have better things to do, so uh, no worries. I think I have the soccer's. Yes, and then tomorrow um, we've got our all day spectacular, or all morning spectacular. <laughs> Uh, That's going to be a fun house party. It's a house, house party style show tomorrow. Uh, everyone's invited. We're going to start at nine. Chris is going to be, I uh, have Citrus Kids with us at 10. Um, I've got uh, um, uh, some special guests coming in at 11, uh, some kids who have looked at my book, um, Wizard Pickles. So that we're going to talk about that. At 12, Jerry and the Seagulls are going to be back. I don't know if they're going to play, play live, like, but they'll play us some songs. And um, yeah, well, we're going to keep going till two when the Kickstarter ends. So we'll be plugging that. And um, yeah, that would be a good time, I hope. Oh, I almost thought we were, I kind of forgot we were live. Yeah, we're still live. I was yeah. Just yeah. So yeah. Live. Well, I, guys, well I, we're all a bit tired, right? We've been doing this all month. It's been a big, long thing. I mean, I don't know. We'll talk, well, we should talk about, you know, what we're doing next. I mean, what should we do next? Or should we Should we keep doing this after I think or like on a... Less if we could do the place, Japanese yeah. game show thing where we just deprive ourselves of sleep and we forget the cameras on and we just let them run 24-7. Yeah. Know? Yeah, we could do that too. Because yeah. <laughs> that's where I, I just know, I went for about a minute. I was like, we're not live. I'll just... Um, no, what I was going to say is uh, I have to jump off. I have a doctor's appointment at right. I think it's at 2.30 in Pacifica. So I'll, I definitely have to jump off early tomorrow, but I'll be here for a good uh, chunk of it. Yeah. And I think I think it'll be fun. Um yeah, I, I don't know. I like I enjoyed doing it. I, I think it was fun. It was like um it's it was an evolution, man. If you go back to the very first episode, mm -hmm. you know, which I don't I'm know if you, you, you can find. Phone. I had you I had you yeah. on my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> my I was like, I can't believe anybody heard anything, you know, or at least for me. Uh, because I had to kind of jump through those two those two loops to get the audio out, but my bandmate said it sounded pretty good. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I think I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm not setting a very high standards for us. Uh, you know, I like to keep standards fairly lax. <laughs> but we've had. I mean, it's been a lot of fun. It's been quite exhausting doing it every day and like getting guests on and stuff like that. Um, you know, they've been great people coming on and chatting away. So it hasn't been that hard. But it's quite a bit of work sort of rang, you know, getting everything lined up. But yeah, yeah you guys, I mean, you, you might want to have some guests you want to have on. I know you sort of said you had a bunch of people you wanted to talk to. I don't know, Dale also. I mean, and there are plenty, there's so many more people I could ask. I just sort of, you know, the people I had on were just people off the top of my head who I knew were sort of currently promoting things or talking about stuff that was related to these some of these themes. Who knew Tim was going to be such a Zardoz fan? <laughs> Everyone is, or should be. It should be, yeah. They just, I mean, I'm just, just on my way. Out. I'm just a Zardoz fan, like in, in processing, you know. Yeah, as soon as well, I you see you might it. need to watch it a few times before you can really start to appreciate it. Well, I feel like they gave away quite a bit, so it might be easier for me. No, you didn't give away. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, in a way, you didn't because I couldn't really relate to any of it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's how you'll feel yeah. when you watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, Dale, I did watch uh, Circle of Iron. Is that what it's called? What Fist of Iron? Uh, 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 nah, I mean, I don't know. It didn't really resonate with me, but um, uh, I don't know if I need to watch it again. I'm not. I, hmm. Yeah, maybe you probably I, need to watch it 10 more times. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if you watch anything 10 more times, you're going to find stuff because, you know, if. If you do anything that amount of times, you're going to see a lot more than you did on the first take. I guess my question is, at some yes, point, like you said yes to it at least three times. You know, ten times, like what we were saying about yesterday. I say yes three times. You know, once you watched it three times, I guess then you've said yes to it three times. Well, I said mm, to it three times. <laughs> mm. Okay, it cocked my head yeah. to it three times. You have to watch it enough times that you've said yes to it three times. You, you, you know, know, there's. Did, did you ever you see the movie Kill Bill with uh, David Carradine? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you remember the bamboo flute? Uh, ooh, that, in the second one, yes. Yeah. That's I, a callback to circle, the, a circle of Iron. Okay. 
right? There's that flute in there. I do not remember that. I mean, I saw those movies about when they came out, which was yeah. what, like 20, 15 years ago? Is that yeah, right? and I've not watched them through uh, again. I'd like to watch them through again, yeah. The, but maybe Circle of Iron first, you'll recommend. But I like, I like the ending of Circle of Iron in Zetan's book that everyone fights over. In the Circle of Iron, uh, the, the, the of ending? Iron at the you, end with Christopher Lee. And you mean the part where they open the book and he starts leafing through it? Yeah. And don't, then he's don't like, say what it is. Spoilers. Yeah, yeah. Is it, um, is, is it the same book from Zardos? No. Do you know what I thought was interesting about that? Uh, this uh, thing about like Bruce Lee. Um, did Bruce Lee write it or produce it? Or uh, I mean, he was he was gone, right? He was dead when they finished the film, I guess. If you buy the DVD and listen to the director's comments by the, I think it was the, I think the comments are by either the producer or the director. They go into that. That was a story that Bruce Lee wanted to do with uh, James Coburn. And Bruce Lee died. Yeah. And, and Coburn was one of his students. Yeah. Uh, Circle of Iron was done in, uh, it was shot in Israel, which is really fascinating. Uh, because a lot of the what you would think would be sets are actually real places with a few terrible map paintings. They looked real to me. I mean, they didn't look like there's so much of that stone, those yep. like natural bridges and stuff. I was like, you know, this this does not look like a set. It looked and pretty I think, authentic. I think some of the horse stuff was done in California. But um, I, it, it was a movie they used to play on USA Network all the time in the late 80s and 90s you know every other week it was on late at night so you know I, I, i'm very fond of it and also you grow up with david carradine so it's a fun role for him yeah you know what's interesting to me it's like so uh i don't know if this is true but you know there's this uh idea and i think it's some of in some of the bruce lee movies where he was one of the people they were considering for Kung Fu, which was a huge hit and David Carradine got it. And of course, David Carradine does not look like he's Japanese or Chinese. And then to cast Carradine in this movie that Bruce Lee had a hand in seemed strange. I mean, maybe there was no animosity there. I don't know. Well, uh, it, <laughs> it's like, it's like he got him in yeah. death as well. <laughs> it's, like... <laughs> it's, it's a Kung Fu movie. It, it's, it's a kung fu movie that's extremely heavily westernized and mm. it just it's a goof um but it's it's an intro to some asian philosophy um yeah i mean these hung kung fu movies were sort of stable there was hong kong cinema where they were yeah. sort of grinding these things out so it's sort of an attempt to like make a big hollywood kind of version yeah Look at all the people are in it. Christopher Lee, Roddy McDowell, Eli Wallach. I mean, Eli Wallach is hilarious. He's in a he's sitting in a vat of oil in the middle of the desert. Yes. Yes, Eli Wallach. Yes, I it took me like I saw was aware of sort of old Eli Wallach. It took me a long time to sort of connect the dots with him as the Eli Wallach from uh, Good, the Bad and the Ugly. You know, I was like, oh wait, <laughs> he's a pretty good actor over the years. He's sort of done some very different things, yeah. But uh, so you haven't watched uh, Charlie Muffin yet? Mm -mm. Oh, that's a good one. It's on. I have um, pulled up, I think, in a tab right now. That's on YouTube. Yeah. So of the three movies I live my life of, it's Zardoz, Circle of Iron, and Charlie Muffin. You don't look like someone who lives their life by a kung fu movie. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be sort of doing some martial arts or something. I don't know. <laughs> you ever no, do I martial arts? I haven't, done, I haven't done Tai Chi and yoga since the pandemic. I, I really need to start again, but I want to yeah. go back to the studio, but I can't go back yet. I uh I did some martial arts. It was pretty it was pretty hot, heavy on the kata and and uh and light on the philosophy, is what I recall. Well, I just yeah, I think the philosophy question. comes through the discipline, isn't it? You know, you do the you do the discipline, and then the philosophy comes at the end. Yeah, I didn't get I didn't get that far. Um, you know, I was pretty young, and my philosophy was it'd be good to be able to kick someone's ass occasionally. You know, 
<laughs> that was my philosophy. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know what that's like. <laughs> yeah, I never kicked anyone's ass. I got into a few fights, but I never won them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a mixed record, you know. Like I, I got in a few fights too, and I, I did not. I think I might have won a, a little bit more than half of them. <laughs> Win because there smaller. wasn't any judge. <laughs> Yes, we don't. I don't yeah, I, mean, I don't approve of physical violence. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, well, that's a complicated issue, isn't it? Especially in the Paleolithic times. An interesting thing. Well, I, I do think that's a very interesting era. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask. You know, so I got into this whole Paleolithic diet thing, like a lot of people. Oh, yes, did. yes, we and, should talk about that. Yeah, right, and yeah, and it was one of my questions, but we just ran out of time. But you know, I read this book called The Paleolithic prescription which was written by these two academics and i bet tim would actually know who these guys are and it was written in i think in the 90s but it, along with the like eat paleo thing which got super popular a little bit later they might have been part of the first movement of it it also just talks about all these other lifestyles around um ways of living around uh paleolithic um people like how they reared their kids, how long they they breastfed, what uh, were their societies like um, fair? Was there like a uh, like a power, like a really strong power, like a hierarchy? Um, I mean, there's they they did the diet thing, but then the second, maybe th the last, maybe third of the book was all this other stuff, you mm -hmm. know, that they were advocating for. Like modern people should take a second look at how Paleolithic people just lived. And yes, that and really I think this book that Phil was talking about was similar. It's like a more recent book, but you know, also saying you know they had a pretty interesting society. It's you know, I think it's just an area that we're learning a lot about all the time. You know, people are doing digs and finding new things all the time. Yeah, like very egalitarian. You know, um, was my take on it. And uh, yeah, I th I don't think it's these authors, but um, I wish I, I knew who, who wrote this, but like uh, a fairer society and also just generally a happier society and way less because they, they've looked at these modern um, hunter gatherers and things like depression are really rare. You know, things like heart disease are really rare. Cancer, really rare. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so this sort of somewhat goes to also, you know, the sort of political are like. going on a little bit, you know, in the U S we're a country that's sort of founded by people wanting to be out on the frontier, you know, this sort of idea of rugged individualism, you know, being a hunter, you know, if you're a hunter in Britain, you're like generally kind of rich, you know, or whatever, you know, or sort of associated, you know, someone rich, who will let you hunt on their land. You know, there aren't really, you know, you can't just sort of go out in the woods and go hunting things very easily in Britain. Mm. You know, whereas here, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to know a noble. Hand. You have to have a, a noble over for dinner twice before you can do that type of hunting. Yeah, you know, and they'll and come over and they'll have they'll flocks, you. They'll, I guess. They'll come and hunt their rabbits or whatever, you know, or a farmer or something. You know, that's fine. And, you know, there are ways to do it if you're interested. But it's like, you know, it's it's not as easy for every man. And it's not as baked into the culture as it is here to sort of be able to do that. And, you know, then, then, then there's a conflict. There's a natural conflict between this sort of idea of the rugged individualist. And then, you know, people living in cities where we're all more increasingly specialized. And yeah, no, quite unable not. to fend for ourselves outside of society. Like, I said, you know, I'm tied to the medical industrial complex, you know, so it's a very different. I always have a very complicated relationship, you know, all my life, you know, since I was young. You know, when you're younger, you're a young man, you know, you, yeah, you do, you know, you can't feel like you're going to survive alone in the world and, you know, do all this, but, you know. I the older you like get, the more, more afflicted you get, you know. So I, I don't know. It's a, it's a complicated issue. I mean, I just say diversity. You know, both things are both fine. You know, Dale's... hunters do the most to protect the environment. The hunters are the ones who are most interested in preserving the animals. You know, there's always fuss about people who pay, say, $10,000 to hunt a rhino. But you forget that that rhino, you know, it would be, you know, they're the ones that they sell the licenses for are ones that are, you know, they need to be killed. Because like an older rhino like goes and kills the younger males and things the like trouble, that. trouble, those trouble so that, that, but no, but the, the important point is that that money looks after the animals and the money, they don't get the money from anywhere else. Like everybody else may say, oh, it's terrible to hunt, but they don't give the money that the hunters give. The hunters have the most interest in preserving the animals because they want to be able to hunt them. So they they care for them. Now, you know, the fact that animals can't really live truly wild anymore is a different issue. That's kind of sad. Um, Dale, I, I, you were saying something about, but you didn't live long. 
you know, hunter gatherers didn't live long. That's one of the things they tackle in this book. They, they basically say, and I, I've told people this so many times over the years, but their argument is uh, hunter gatherers actually had about, had uh, similar lifespans as modern people did. But the way that they did the math on it is uh, life was really harsh until you're maybe like five or even 10, like kids, kids died. A lot of kids died. And there was this yes, infanticide was issue in um, too. So if you take all these deaths that are like under four years old and you average them in, it does bring the lifespan way down. But if you survive childhood as a hunter gatherer, uh, you've got a uh, similar lifespan to like modern people, which is mm. it was oh, just kind of yeah. crazy. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that they do uh, cover in that book. I'm sure somebody else covers it. But there still seems to be this thing that like you drop dead when you're 40. You know, everybody I talk to just thinks you, as a hunter gatherer, you drop dead when you're 40. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yeah, but they, you don't want to be a kid. Yeah. <laughs> but did they live? Do you think they lived like in the Bible said, like, you know, the oldest people were living sort of 700 years? You know, you go through all that bit. And then totally. They, I think the years were a little bit different back then. Years. <laughs> That's one of my favorite bits in the Robert I think Robert years books. were a little uh, lo more loosely defined in that era. <laughs> yeah, Chris, are you familiar? Are you guys familiar with the Robert Crumb's book of Genesis? It's mm -hmm. really phenomenal. You, do you know, Chris, do you know our problem, the artist, the underground cartoonist? I've seen his work and I saw the documentary on him, which is pretty sad. Um, yes. I think it's just called Crumb. Yes. But I, I never like read read through his body of work. Well, I highly recommend he did a book of Genesis. He was just like more recently, you know, or, you know, about no. a decade or two ago, a decade or so ago. But he, um, you know, he completed it. He worked on it for many years, I think. But he was going to do a sort of satire of Adam and Eve. And then he looked at the story and he said, actually, I don't need to do a satire. This whole story is completely ridiculous. I'm just going to do it straight. And so then he got really into doing a straight illustration job of the book of Genesis. He said there's been a lot of cartoon cartoonists who've said they've drawn a book of Gen cartoon versions of the book of Genesis when they say it's the word of God. Well, theirs isn't. I'm doing exactly what's written in the Bible. You know, I'm, you know, he, so he has done the only complete accurate book of Genesis and it's a totally weird, freaky thing. It's lovely. And, you know, but his drawings are so, you know, they're freaky and beautiful and realistic at the same time. You know, he did all the sort of research, you know, he loves his research. He said he went back to all the Hollywood movies, <laughs> which actually then themselves were quite well researched for, um, you know, the costumes and props and everything and just ha that has it all. It just looks beautiful. It's amazing. Takes you back to that world. And then, he, and then in the back, he's got all sorts of notes about his own personal theories about it, which are that it's trying to sort of suppress a more earlier, more female dominated culture of the Earth Mother. And he sort of points to all these sort of incidents in Genesis where, you know, it's sort of establishing this sort of dominance of men over females which is you know that's his own kind of crazy theory but he makes a lot of sense in that too and that's worth interesting but you know that's sort of an addendum at the back of the book in his notes you know you can just read it through and you know as he says it's the word it's the word of god as it's written down and you know and he does all these he does these pages where he goes through all the bagats and all this sort of stuff which is very fun you know and there's all the great story all the great genesis stories in there you know those are all the stories we learned in sunday school you know it's a great book but it's odd because it's crumb and I remember when it came out, there were people complaining about it, even though it was a straight illustration of the story. Because mm -hmm. the, right, because it was, too, it was too, too many horrible things were going on. People were like, wait, wait, like, well, this is your Bible. Right. <laughs> this and is what you're reading. The <laughs> other thing is, there are people who think that they own the Bible and get to determine who illustrates it and who interprets it for people. So for someone yeah. like Crumb, who has a history of underground comics, you know, how dare this guy illustrate Genesis? Hmm. It's, it's, it's interesting because if you look back at um, the beginnings of Western printing, one of the first comic, well, they consider them comic books, were what were called Popper's Bibles which were in essence uh, printed uh, wood carvings of scenes from the Bible. They're a way of passing this on to people who were illiterate. And it's one of the first examples of uh, cartooning. Because um, they were just simple things to print. But there's a long history of uh, comics in the Bible. Um, chick tracks, for example, which are just out there wait is that the 
little uh that little i brought this up before i think those little booklets that i didn't know existed until my friend from florida who's basically an atheist uh told me you know that this is a thing chick track yes. chick track jack chick they're, right. they're like little yeah, little moral I parables that are kind of scary i heard of yeah, them before, but but um, like everyone in the wild i don't wish to offend any of the viewers but there's a lot of controversy over them because they're not necessarily traditional religious views but some of them are the personally held views by the publisher Jack Chick. And a lot of people who are not religious collect them because they are out there. The artwork is often out there. You could argue that they're the first fanzines. Mm -hmm. um, but and he's I, got his unique method of, he, you know, he just sort of distributes them freely everywhere. You know, he operates a website where you can get them. Yeah, he's very famous in D&D. &D. There's one like, you know, uh, oh, I forget what it's called, but, you know, yes, it's well known. Like, you know, they start playing D&D &D and get into satanic cults and all this. And he draws it in a sort of fairly realistic sort of, you know, you look like, you feel like you're reading a sort of a proper comic in, I guess, the way that they're sort of drawn, you know, like, you know, they're not exaggerated caricatures. They're sort of properly drawn people. People it's buy them by the brick. Like, you'll buy a thousand or a hundred of, one issue which covers a specific topic and then people leave them at bus stations or uh, public restrooms uh, they just leave them around hoping that people pick them up and there's other books like that I I'm on a 14 um, Facebook page and there are other religious sects they won't just leave things like chick tracks they'll leave entire hardback books just on a bus station uh, or a public bus bench or on a, a coffee table. And they're just hoping someone picks the book up and reads it. But you have to wonder. I know what the feeling. Economics. Yeah, well. You know. <laughs> and people complain about Bitcoin being wasteful. Still chance to back. Where's it? Bitsy Spider. You can pick up your copy on Kickstarter now. We're funded. So if you back it, you will be receiving it. Yes. And you, you cannot find it at a bus stop or laying around anywhere. So, yes. <laughs> it will not be available at bus stop or bargain bins. There's no Chick Tracks version of it either. But it's interesting. <laughs> all of these. There's no religious. There's no. Yeah. Despite everything we've talked about on this show, there's no hidden messages or secret meanings in Where's Itsy Bitsy Spider. Just like, you know, we're all very different. We can all get along. And, you know, it's quite a nice place to be. You know, even though we're all crowded in here together. <laughs> well, it's it's just it's how do you how do you draw something and how do you get it published and how do you distribute it? That's the really interesting thing about these books, because uh, some books don't take traditional methods to get to the public. And they're sticky. Even, go on. Well, they're sticky. And then uh, my question is like, what are they resonating with? Like, because my recollection of them is they're pretty fire and brimstone. They're loaded with fear and and like yes, anger yeah, yeah. and designed to terrify you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. They're designed to terrify you. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's like Noam Noam Chomsky. I think he, he's one of the guys that like just says like the fear in this country is like off the charts. And we also we love our guns, we love our religion, um, and there's just a lot of fear here. And I think maybe, yeah, that's that's what's resonating. Too many blue squares propagating that fear in their it's in their interest to make them think. And I think there probably were, you know, this, this country does attract them a little bit. Because they get chased out of their own countries and they have to come here. Very nervous, anxious monkeys. <laughs> an anxious monkeys that fled from over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that means me, does me, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't Malcolm yeah. Gladwell have a book about get away that? with it over there to come here? <laughs> but they said like my friend who was like he was working for well, he was a friend a guy grew in the village where i lived and uh i know he was he's got sort of nerdy he's like he's someone who spoke a bit like hg wells as well like keith keith barker and he got into doing uh, uh spreadsheets and things and so next thing you know he was working for all these timeshare people down in uh south of spain you know and they all got very very dodgy but you know he'd say oh there's one born every minute charlie oh i wish i could come to america that's where that's where it is you know that's where they, that's where he wanted to come and be operating the scams. <laughs> I, that's where I would do it too. It's a good yeah, kids. If you're watching, you want to learn how to use a spreadsheet. If that's any advice that I can give you is learn Excel or a similar program because spreadsheets are awesome. 
Go on. Well, Go on. I, what will I use these spreadsheets for? How will they? Everything. How will they improve my life? They're the killer app. You know, these, like you know that spreadsheets. You know, they had computers. Like, what are we going to do with them? All of a sudden, they came up with spreadsheets. Wow. This is like accountants had to sit there, like doing all that stuff by hand. That was like your job, like creating these things by hand. All of a sudden, you can like got this massive power. I mean, that's really the main power of computing is spreadsheeting. If you go looking for a job and you can tell them that you can use a word processor and a spreadsheet program, they'll love you. All right. So, I, well, my son's not watching these shows despite having been a guest, but uh, I've been trying to tell him the same thing. He's quite good at Premiere. He did a video for my, uh, you know, when I was doing some jigsaw puzzles and, you know, he just goes on like, just, you know, learn your bloody Premiere skills. You know, you can get jobs around here just being able to do that. And spreadsheets. I use and spreadsheets a tiny bit. I hear the blockchain is kind of like a big spreadsheet in the sky. In yes. fact, I listened to this uh, talk about this guy that was basically saying blockchain is overhyped. He's like, for most of the things, you can just use a spreadsheet. He was like, you don't have to blockchain everything, even though it's wildly <laughs> popular. Just use a spreadsheet. Maybe he has a point. I don't know. It's certainly faster. Spreadsheets well, in my rear end. All right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dale. Uh, uh, well, I think that that's good enough for today, right? We've like we've ended up deciding that spreadsheets are the greatest thing ever. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. our, our producer is saying it's a wrap now. We've gone to spreadsheets. <laughs> Wait. So it's been Zardoz, Chick Tracks, and spreadsheets. Yes, we're doing okay. well. And then Paleolithic societies. Yes. And this is a video to support a children's book named Itsy Bitsy Spider. Covered it all. <laughs> Cast a wide net. We're celebrating diversity, which is what Itsy Bitsy Spider We're is also celebrating. Why has there got any backers at all? This is a marketplace of ideas. <laughs> it's been enormously entertaining, guys. Oh, it really has. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so, we'll be back later today i'm going to be back with dale at four and we're going to talk to jason thompson and yeah chris will be back i'm back tomorrow morning i don't have a guest lined up for nine o'clock hour i'm trying to get somebody in but maybe i think tomorrow i'm going to mostly be you know i don't know trying to focus on itsy bitsy spider a bit you know for the first hour you could draw we'll be on yeah. at 10 with the band so will you be with us for the first hour or are you just going to join us at 10 chris uh, actually, that's where I squeeze in the band meeting in the first hour. Yeah. Okay. So you, and, yeah, you uh, do the band meeting, and then we'll see you at ten. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, you know, we have to have our hair and makeup done for about an hour, and then we come on. All right. How about you, Dale? Are you going to be able to join in the morning? Uh, what time? Nine. At nine. Yeah, I'll, I'll set my alarm. All right, guys, thank you so much. You guys have both been so awesome all this time. It's been real fun. And yeah, if we go forward and do more, then, you know, I want to do it on like whatever terms you guys want to do, really. <laughs> you know, this has been my little project. But yeah, I'm like open to whatever. I have a writer with certain snacks. Yeah. And drinks. More Zardoz. More Zardoz. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm going to end the stream and play the music then. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for whoever. There's somebody there's tuned in all the way through the show. Really appreciate it. Um, see, you, see you later and see you tomorrow. Now I'm just going up this water spout, y'all. Y'all, y'all. Hope it don't rain. The itsy bitsy spider climbed up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun dried up all the rain so the itsy bitsy spider climbed up the spout again Again. It's going up this up the spout again. It's going up this up the spout again.